Great. Okay. Yep. Hmm. So we're right at the nine o'clock hour. So welcome, everyone. Um, we're happy to have you here, and we're really excited to be here to um, have this discussion today uh, regarding maintaining health in the food environment and how does marketing and promotion influence food choice. Um, a few housekeeping issues. So if you'd like to ask a question to the panel, it's going to be a very informal discussion today. So if you'd like to join the discussion, ask a question, have a comment, please use the Q&A feature. You can also use the chat feature and I'll be moderating uh, responses and entries in there. So what I'm going to do now is just give a brief intro to all of our speakers and then we can get started uh, with the discussion. So again, thank you everyone for joining our panel today. We'll start off introducing Dr. Rachel Cheatham. So Dr. Cheatham leads the Foodscape Group uh, Incorporated Consultancy Group in Chicago. Um, as a navigation partner, Rachel helps companies conceptualize, position, and market healthier foods and beverages in the global marketplace. Rachel holds a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from Tufts, where she is also an adjunct, adjunct assistant professor. She's actually been a commercial TV producer, uh, director at the International Food Information Council, and senior vice president at the global PR firm Weber Shadnick. So thank you, Rachel, for being here. Thank you. Um, I'll then move on to Dr. Francis Fleming. So uh, Dr. Fleming is the director and mar director, excuse me, of marketing initiatives at the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Health at UConn down in Connecticut. Her current research focuses on assessing child-directed food marketing and social media and improving the foods and beverages parents feed their children through parent-targeted interventions and policy change. So thank you, Fran, for being here. There she is, yeah. And then um, Dr. Masterson. So Travis Masterson directs the Health Ingestive Behavior and Technology Laboratory at Penn State University. Travis's lab has been monitoring and evaluating the effects of influencer food marketing on live streaming entertainment platforms, including platforms such as Twitch, in the effects that of this type of marketing can have on food purchasing and eating behavior. So thanks, Travis, for being here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started with a discussion. So a little bit about me, y'all know uh, me, for those of you who don't, my early research program, we'll give it a second, I don't know if you want to. Okay, great. So my early research program uh, focused on food marketing uh, to children and youth. And at that time, we focused on commercial TV advertising because that was the primary uh, source of advertising for young kids. And TV was the primary source of media use for kids as well. Um, of course, we know today it's very different. Digital media, um, including social media and online video platforms such as YouTube or TikTok, are the primary source of media for children, including really young children, uh, uh, preschool age kids. So that said, how, so Travis, I'll ask you, I'll direct this question to you at, at first. How is food and drinks, how are they being portrayed in social media and digital media now? Yeah, I think it, it kind of depends what platform you're talking about. Um, there's, I mean, there's general consistency across like what types of foods are present in social media. Um, but then there's like a wide range of like how those foods pitch themselves, how they're engaged with on different platforms and, and how they're presented. But um, I mean, for the most part, we know generally like they're all going to be like highly processed, uh, high energy, dense, low nutrient profile foods that are are being pushed out there. Right. Um, and and then you'll and then you see a variety of like interactions and techniques used to promote those. Um, I think some of the more alarming ones are particularly the ones like um, aimed at children, where you're seeing a lot of like kid influencers, mm. um, and you're seeing like the products pushed in like a, a really uh, unique way. I think so. I just saw I just saw a video um, on TikTok actually. Uh, they were doing like s'mores products, right? And it wasn't just like, oh, here's our s'mores, let's make it. It was like a kitchen filled with, um, you know, graham crackers and candy bars and marshmallows and stuff like that, right? So it's kind of like this over the top, like, um, kind of like emotional. It was like the kid and his dad, like this emotional tie type videos um, that comes across, like, I think a lot more authentic than um, previous types of advertising like typical video advertising right like you, there's some good examples of some commercials that'll pull, pull the heartstrings or whatever right but um but you get this really like authentic feel from like these influencers engaging on um, their audiences in a meaningful way so 
Yeah. Can I have yeah, a follow-up I... question to that? When mm -hmm. you talk about influencers, can you give us a general description? And Fran, why don't I uh, toss this to you? I know you've done a lot of work in this area. Yeah, I was just about to say. Yeah, what, do, what do we mean by that? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, we just did a study where we looked at um, child influencers on YouTube, and these were the most popular um, influencers on, on YouTube. And Interestingly, these are were also uh, influencers who were in this category of um, on these made for kids channels. Mm -hmm. So YouTube de actually designated these channels as made for children under the age of 13 on the regular platform. And four out of every 10 videos that we analyzed had you know unhealthy foods in them, mostly candy. Um, but I think to Travis's point, um, in these videos, the way they they were portrayed, it wasn't that they were just present is that the kids interacted with them. We found that there was a, a pretty high rate of them either about to eat the food or actually eating the food. And we know from other research that that has, you know, sort of an extra impact on, on children. So it's it's not just, um, you know, it, maybe it, it feels uh, different in a way that I think Travis was, was getting to because it's someone that these kids love, appreciate, admire. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's something called a parasocial relationship that um, children would have with these, you know, child influencers. So it it feels, um, you know, that there's some there's some major concern there because it's not typical advertising, you know, as as we would know it. And you were talking about earlier, Jennifer. Um, but in this case, it just seems to pop up in different places. So it's not really managed by any type of policy. It's within the videos. There mm -hmm. were, you know, there were. Yeah. We only really saw a couple of food ads uh, in between, and, and they're prohibited anyway. So the policy doesn't really protect the way the food's being presented. Yeah. Could you could yeah. you speak to that just a second, uh, just a little more? You mentioned the food ads are prohibited. Could you expand on that? Oh yeah, and then I'll let Travis jump in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so when when YouTube created this, you know, made for kids group of of videos uh, and chat, they're they're you know specifically for children under the age of 13, they also said, okay, we're, we're not going to, we're going to prohibit food and beverage ads on these particular channels. And there are some videos that are made for kids designations um, and you can't put comments on them either. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, you know, monitoring the ads, we did see a lot of ads for other things. We just saw a couple for food, but um, you know, the ones that had uh, food in them, there were at least, you know, about four different types of food presentations, unique presentations for each one. Um, and so, you know, and, and then, you know, to, to get to this other point, that out of all these videos with food, there, and there were, there were, you know, four out of every 10, as we said, only, only one video had a disclosure that said mm. there was a sponsorship by mm. the, by the brand. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of a, it's an unusual thing. You come, you know, they, these child, child influencers may be showing brands uh, and not being paid, but um, mm. if the policy is only present, if their companies are paying for the brand to be there, then the policy doesn't work. Mm. Fascinating. Travis? Well, I was just going to like expand on on what Francis was saying, uh, that it, I think it goes beyond kids too. So in one of our survey studies that we did with uh, like adolescents and young adults, uh, we actually saw like on the platform Twitch, um, where it's like live streaming and they they interact with the influencers, um, they viewed advertising on that platform as less annoying mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, like more authentic, essentially, like it didn't bother them um, as much. And we had also asked some questions about not directly why, um, but but what they thought about that, what the purpose of the ads were. And on Twitch, they perceive the ads as supporting their, um, you know, like the, the influencer specifically, like directly influencing their their mon their monetary status. Right. And so um, the we, we asked them questions about um, YouTube as well. Right. So on YouTube, they felt like the, the money was in, uh, going to support YouTube, like the website itself. So like the corporate the man right whereas like on twitch it was going to support their their friends essentially right like their content creator and so like that's that parasocial relationship and that authenticity that we're talking about is that like people perceive that type of advertising much differently 
mm -hmm. um, because they see the personal the personal connection. They see who it's supporting. They want those people supported. And so, you know, like if Kit Kat comes in and says, hey, I'm going to support your best friend, you'd be like, yeah, I love Kit Kats, right? Like, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it it's not just, uh, I think, targeted at kids, but spans up into mm -hmm. adolescence and young adulthood mm -hmm. um, and probably even adulthood. I can imagine those are both very attractive audiences. So pivoting to Rachel from the industry perspective, I mean, do companies recognize the power of social media and reaching reaching kids in this age group? And then also with respect to food, are they marketing food in these areas purposefully? So the answer definitely is yes. I think the power of social media is recognized um, by brands. I think what's interesting about the conversation so far is I like how you teed it up, Jennifer, about like in your own training mm -hmm. back in the day, we were analyzing TV ads. Um, and TV ads are hyper controlled, they're pre recorded, they're signed off by across hmm. multiple company executives, like, right, everything is very top down fixed. And now we're in a flip of that where it's more bottom up. And to Travis's point, you, you use some keywords around authenticity and kind of more um, emotive and free form. Like, this is what. Uh, certainly children, but I think increasingly adults are coming to expect. They don't want to feel like it's contrived. They don't want to feel like it's the brand message being shouted at them from the top and they should just like listen and, and believe. So I think there's power in that, but in that power is where we find some of the issues that have already been raised. And what's interesting to me as someone who has, you know, one foot in academia um, in terms of like marketing and a, and a sort of how do we academically look at marketing and then one foot working with many of the large and small food and beverage companies out there um, for, you know, a couple of decades now. So what I find most interesting is that look how quickly the conversation turned, not about the brand, not even about the product, but quickly to like the influencer, who, who is the messenger? And I think that's where, to Francis's point, we don't have policies around, like the most we have is to say, if you're doing a sponsored post, you have to hashtag it sponsored, which I can tell you from my experience, brands know that, brands tell their influencers that, um, does it always happen? I don't know, probably not. We, you know, It's an attempt to make it happen. But for me, what stands out is that it, we haven't really even talked about, I mean, Travis, you mentioned like, you know, a s'mores piece or whatever. Um, in theory, everything we're talking about, like which influencer does a brand choose to work with or not? What are the, you know, kind of hashtags they are asked to use or not? Like there's a lot of power in those decisions and all that is kind of outside of the scope for better or worse right now of like the product, like you could use those same tools and be talking about, you know, green goddess salads. Um, that's not always what happens. But what I find interesting is like the tools of the day versus the hurdles we're facing with how do you control messaging in a very free form, authentic influencer space? Like, I think that's a question that that any brand I've worked with, and I suspect any brand out there, they absolutely grapple with it, even if they have the best of intentions. Um, it it gets away from them too, you know? It can get away from them. Yeah, and I'd like to jump in here. I mean, interestingly, when we did this YouTube paper, and we try to think about our research and how it would inform a policy, you know, it's just sort of when we when we ask our question to begin with. Could I, Fran, um, could I step yeah. back and ask you just to give a couple lines about that study for the audience? Yeah, so, yeah, sure. We looked at um, a, a sample of um, these top child influencer um, videos from these top child influencer channels. So there were uh, thir 13 of them. Um, and we compared a sample of uh, 200 videos uploaded um, in 2019 and then a videos uploaded in 2020. Um, in the beginning of 2020, in January, that's when the policy was put in place for no food and beverage advertising on, on these channels. 
So we thought that maybe there would be an increase in product placement you know, within the videos. We thought perhaps that would be the case. Um, it really wasn't. There were, there were foods in 2019 and 2020. Was there a little bit more of certain things? Yes, there was more candy. There was also an increase in how the, the products were portrayed um, in that uh, influencers were more likely to you know, consume them or, or be about to consume them in the 2020 videos uploaded. Um, so there were some minor differences, but the, but the food and beverage brands in these videos um, were you know frequent, mostly unhealthy, um, and then also portrayed in a way that they were about to be eaten very often. Um, but you know the the interesting thing is that YouTube, you know, talked to these to, these uh, content creators and said you have to make yeah. these channels, designate them made for kids, and you know had they 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 create policies and have sort of I don't want to say conversation, but they put a lot out there on restrictions. So they really could say. Hey, you know what? You can't have branded products unless you have, you know, express consent from companies, um, or hmm. you know, there's there's plenty uh, that they could do. Uh, and similarly, uh, many of the products that were portrayed are from brands in um, the children's food and beverage advertising initiative. So they're, you know, where they they don't advertise to to kids, or they they you know they, they the, the job is to sort of shift the mix so that healthier foods are advertised to kids. So considering that those companies, you know, were those brands for those companies were in the videos, they could also say to YouTube, hey, you know, we mm. never gave consent for these um, brands to be in here. Mm. We're, uh, we want to protect children from exposure to these brands. So, you know, we'll support you. You need to do something about it. So in this case, there is some space for policy to play a role. Although I would agree, agree Rachel, it's, you know, it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's a space that, that's really tricky, even from a policy perspective. And, and to that point, um, you know, the idea that you should put hashtag ad or this is an ad, that's certainly a, a policy, but there's really no evidence that that actually, you know, ha has a dulling effect on the influence. And it could even yeah. actually have a, a negative effect. And I think, Travis, you might want yeah. to Yeah, well, so I was... Yeah, I was going to say that, like, Anna Coates and Emma Boylan, I think uh, it was them that had a study that show that the hashtag actually has the opposite effect. So it actually increases intake and perception of the brand. Mm. And it goes back to, I think that support, like when it's influencer related, right? It like, again, those brands actually get to kind of like co-opt the relationship with the, the influencer. And so actually disclosing the hashtag isn't as as harmful because it's really the the influencer saying like yeah i'm on board with this they're giving me money I, i'm i'm happy to promote their product right and i think that's different than what we had seen previously um you know like with like video ads on tv but this this also used to be a big issue in radio with like radio hosts how they were like uh positioning themselves as brands and stuff like that and so I think it's a yeah it's a it's an interesting space but yeah like Francis said it doesn't seem to be protective at at the moment and and potentially even the other way so that's great so I'm I'm also hearing a lot of information about you know so attachment with the influencer and the influencer having their own brand let's say so Rachel what are there any characteristics about an influencer that are we should be aware of or we could should be concerned about when it comes to promoting food so food is really critical you know for health and we're talking a lot about these unhealthy foods being promoted so can we is there a certain level of trust or confidence that we can have in influencers when it comes to promoting food yeah i mean i think speaking at least thinking of adults so i think the children con conversation is probably more intense and different in terms of what should be done, what could be done. But when you think of like adult influencers in the nutrition, health, wellness space, um, it's my anecdotal observation over years of doing this kind of work that for better or worse, probably worse, there's a bit of an inverse relationship between credentials. Are they an MPH? Do they have an RD? Are they a PhD? Are they an MD? Like just, you know, any of the above, all of the above. Um, and their their level of influence, if you measure influence by the number of followers and, and more, mm -hmm. you know, typical engagement rates and things like this. So 
said like more succinctly, if you're on social media, you know, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, whichever all you want, like if you have a more skewed or extreme perspective mm -hmm. on something, on the keto diet, on intermittent fasting, on a juice cleanse, like just something that feels distinct and memorable and, and intriguing, like, and you can build a big following because you have that distinction, then that just takes off. And if you're just out there as a well-trained, you know, here we are all scientists being all intellectual, and you're just talking about maybe the Mediterranean diet and let's eat some nuts and seeds and whole grains. Like that's lovely. And you can even be creative with that content. Those people are out there, but you probably don't get 3 million following you. Mm -hmm. you, you probably aren't going to get the Joe Rogan podcast crowd to listen to you. Do you know what I mean? And so that's a challenge. That's a challenge. And I think um, brands, you know, one piece of the puzzle that that's probably worth mentioning is the truth of the matter is for a lot of brands of, of a certain size, they turn over the management of their influencer and content strategy to agencies. Hmm. So you can have a digital marketing agency, you can have an advertising agency, you can have a public relations agency. And so if nothing else, there just is a, there are a lot of different individuals behind the scenes trying to figure out what is the right strategy. And it, it just, it gets, um, it can get away from you if, if you're not careful and pretty soon, you know, you find your, you being a brand, you find yourself in the hot seat because maybe you did or said something or one of your influencers mm -hmm. that you are tied to financially did or said something that is off your brand. Um, you thought they were going to talk about this and pretty soon they're talking about that. Um, what's interesting on the, in those kinds of situations is if it's something highly controversial, perhaps a little unsettling for many, it will draw attention. And sometimes that attention draw gives the brand a boost, mm -hmm. even if it was the wrong kind of attention. Uh, so it's just a very, um, very dynamic very powerful force that for the world of social media that for me I really put a lot of emphasis on the messenger as much as what is the message what is the content like who is delivering this I think is really important and that isn't something you can you know regulate uh, it, it's social it's social media it's democratization of media so I, it's a very tricky area to navigate. Yeah, and I think to that point, um, when, once you start to extend the policies to um, all influencers, um, it does get to be challenging. But there, when there are spaces to put some um, restrictions on them in terms of policy, as I was just mentioning um, earlier with, with YouTube, I mean, I, I think that um, you can't sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, there's nothing we can do. This is just the wild west. We we can't control. I mean, when when it can be done, um, it should be done, and it certainly should be done for children. Mm -hmm. um, even though you know, I would agree with Travis. I mean, I I I don't. We've written papers about this that adolescents, um, you know, maybe even more susceptible uh, given their you know age and. Um, what's going on with them in their in their growth and their brain development to this type of influence. Um, but I do think that, you know, to go back to where can we put real policies that work in place and, you know, sort of level the playing field so that one brand doesn't get, you know, who's trying to maybe to your point, Rachel, trying to do the right thing and then, you know, just kind of loses market share because, they say, oh, we're going to, you know, be by the book and we agree. Well, then, yes, someone who's flashier and has a million followers and says crazy mm -hmm. things is going to get, you know, the, the attention or be able to better promote a brand. So I, I think that having, you know, researchers and people who are showing evidence of what policies might work based on their research come into play in terms of government policies, that would be a, you know, good step in the right direction 
to even though it's pretty clear it's a, it's a space that's changing all the time and you know you can barely keep up with it in terms of research um and it's really challenging to show effects i mean we know that yeah and what about travis what about the space of being online what is it about that you know that this environment that you know amplifies these messages these extreme messages yeah like what might make it more effective or, yeah. or so, yeah so um we we have a paper under review <laughs> so hopefully we'll see how it goes um but in online spaces there's just so much going on and so what we what we really went back to in our group was looking at like what are some of like the classic ways of approaching things uh in media so there's principles like like saturation and congruency um that are really important in in how ads so so for example congruency is like if you're watching a, a a football game and you get a an ad for Gatorade that's congruent right but if you're watching a football game and you get an ad for I don't know something <laughs> something that's like way off base it would be incongruent right and so there's data around like how that that plays into how those ads are accepted by people and then saturation is how much of the ad is present right and so sometimes um like in more traditional media saturation is like how often will an ad run um like is it out on billboards like those types of things right but in an online space you can do both of those things so by increasing the saturation of the ads it increases the congruency right so for example on twitch they can co-op the entire page and change the background of Twitch, like the entire website to be their ad. And then they can have um, video ads and banner ads that link up. And then the stream title will link up with that. And then do you see what I'm saying? And then the, the influencers got the product placed and then they're talking about it. So even if like, you know, that product like KitKat doesn't align with League of Legends, like those are very like disparate things, but as they layer on all of these elements, it brings it into congruency for the, the viewer, right? And so like, yeah, so that's, I think one of the, the biggest things that, that we're trying to start to look at is that specifically is like, how does this layering affect things um, to improve like the, the congruency, the acceptability of the message? Um, and then I think another point that is really, that gets brought up a lot, and I don't have a good answer for this one is like the, the influencer themselves, right? So there's a whole nother set of, like, you could look at it from the marketing perspective, but then you could look at it from the social perspective as well, right? Like how popular is the influencer? Are they the same sex? Are they the same gender? Are they the same age? Like, you know, like those types of things. So there's all these questions about like, what would be optimal or 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 which type of influencer is best to talking to which type of audience or influencing you know and so there that's why i think the space is really is really ripe for a lot of research because there's so many questions whatever your like individual perspective is that actually adds like a very important piece to the puzzle right of like you could look at the marketing you could look at the social you could look at the food you could look at, you know like there's so many things to go and investigate um and look at so yeah, I think it's interesting because it goes to sort of the source credibility research and persuasion, you know, so when do you want a message from someone who's like you? When do you want a message from someone who has authority? You know, so there's a lot of studies, you know, older studies, really, that a similar source is better in certain cases or someone with, you know, um, some sort of authority is better to, to depending on what the message is and the product. But um yeah, I think it's 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 interesting to think about it. And then to that point, when it comes to children as child influencers, I mean, adults are involved in this whole process. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a it's another issue, and it's not one we're studying. But I mean, you know, what does it mean to support your child and be the one who's holding the camera and making the decisions to bring the Lay's potato chips in, or the cans mm -hmm. of Coke, or the Kit Kats, or because yeah. the kids certainly aren't making the decisions on that one. <laughs> um, and so while we talk about these kids as sending the message, there's, you know, adults in the room who are doing yeah. this. And sometimes they're they're frequently part of the of the of the play and the, you know, they're involved in in the um in the storyline. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a that's a you know big concern. And I think that brings up another 
point to your initial question is like there's this unseen hand in these digital spaces. So, um, so for example, we published a paper where we had we had evidence of um, we don't know who it was though, right? So this is the thing is, but we have evidence of a moderator taking out a negative comment from the chat um, during a live stream. And so, you know, like we had video recorded that and, 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 and we have that published now, but that's the other thing, not, not just in the kids space with the adults making the decisions, who's mm -hmm. passing the money, but like, there's also people moderating these spaces, but again, they go, they seem very authentic, right? So like, you'd be in that space and everybody's typing in and like, oh, this is cool. We like this product. I like this product. And then we had somebody throw out like the, the comment that got deleted was, why are you contributing to childhood obesity? And the comment got deleted like immediately. And um, it was during like a, a Reese's uh, ad that was going on. It wasn't so someone on your team who was in the chat doing that? <laughs> No, no, that's a, yeah. We were like we we weren't in there. Yeah, wow. no, but but we had the video recording of it. Well, we 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 did pitch an idea. Like we wanted to do a study where we did that and see like how often we got censored. <laughs> um, but but that's kind of the point, right? Is like that chat stream is going so quickly that it's mm -hmm. hard for people to really pick up on what's going on. Uh, it's, it's a if if you've never been on a live stream that's very popular, it's it's an interesting experience because you do get what is happening, like you're able to read what's happening and kind of get the general sentiment of the room essentially, right? It's like, it's a weird social thing to, to go through, but but some things happen so quickly that that they are easy to miss. And so, so that was one, right? And so there's somebody censoring that. And, and we looked into it, we said like, did it violate the, the, the chat room rules of the influencer? Did it violate Twitch's rules? And the comment, didn't violate anything. So the only thing that we could come up with was that it had like this direct tie to public health issues and somebody, either the, the ad company or the, the moderation team of the, the influencer, you know, took it out. And um, so, so yeah, it's, I think it's like a really interesting conundrum of like, it, everything seems really authentic. It seems like you're in this environment, but it is probably much more controlled than it actually comes across to people. Um, and I think that's hard for adults to pick up on. And so increasingly, so it's it's going to be more difficult for uh, teens to pick up on and, and kids even, right? Because you're kind of like trusting of these environments and these people um, early on um, mm -hmm. when you're developing these social relationships, kind of like what Francis was saying, it's like it's part of your developmental trajectory to like give trust to other social groups outside of your own, right? And so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's just, it's a, one more layer of things going on there. <laughs> a lot going on. Thank you. So I do want to remind everyone too in the audience, feel free to use the Q&A um, as Kelly commented and where we can field some questions. I want to pivot a little bit to Rachel. So I'm hearing a lot about this marketing and promotion of foods in the digital space. It's concerning because these are unhealthy products. So I'm hearing candy and um, I think somebody mentioned fast food as well. So in terms of and we also talk about regulation, right? Like, should we come in and start to regulate the promotion of these products for public health reasons? But in terms of industry, what is it, are there any um, advantages or impetus for industry to promote healthier for you products? Um, and if not, like, what are the challenges of promoting healthier products? Sure, I think that there is definitely an understanding within industry, broadly speaking, you know, the food industry, that consumers want more healthful products. They don't want the foods they choose to eat to make them unhealthy and unwell and overweight and pre-diabetic. Like it stands to reason consumers want health and well-being through what they eat. Um, and there's way more awareness around that. Having said that, it is interesting over the years to watch when a company or really like a brand within a larger company say, say develops a skew, you know, a, a, pro, a one item product um, that is healthier by probably most standard definitions of, you know, it hits the mark on being a low sodium or it hits the mark on keeping added sugars to under, you know, five or 10%, like depending on which guidance you want to follow, it can hit the mark on a lot of um, nice points nutritionally, and then it doesn't sell. 
It sits on the shelf next to the product that arguably isn't empirically as healthy and skew sits and it doesn't sell. So then what is that brand to do? Are they supposed to put more money behind it? Put more, you know, let's let's call up the the digital agency that we're working with and put more dollars behind marketing to help push the product, help consumers understand why this product is valuable, you know, in their eating pattern. Like, do you put more behind it? Do you pull it and say it didn't work? Um, do you try to, and this is often what happens, do you try to find ways to have it be more nutrient dense, mm -hmm. have it be healthier, which is a term that's a loaded term in of itself, but you know, lower salt, lower sugar, something like this, but you just don't call it out as super healthy. So for example, if I have a cracker and I want to make a low sodium cracker, should my goal as a marketer be to make sure I can get a low sodium claim, in which case my consumer may think, oh, it won't taste good. Or should I just say, this is a new cracker we're trying that has a hint of salt and not really say high, low and not try to get an FDA healthy symbol on, which, you know, we know those are coming. Um, I think it's a really, it's a, it's a delicate space. And by delicate, I mean to say a marketer is in a position needing to please corporate stakeholders nutrition guidance being truly helpful for the consumer who doesn't want to be unwell. And then the taste metrics of what that consumer either grew up expecting mm -hmm. and then suddenly you shift it. Like you can't just drop out sugar and salt and expect the taste to stay the same or there, become, there becomes different workarounds. And yes, we got our sugars way down. Um, we've now gone keto and we have erythritol. And then you have a headline that comes out that we're all smiling. We saw in this past couple of weeks, what if this causes some kind of cardiovascular problem? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one study. We got a lot to do, but the headlines are out there. And so I think to, for me, working in the space I do kind of between these worlds, I personally see a lot of marketers who honestly have the best of intentions and they're trying to figure out how to crack the code, how to please all these different stakeholder groups. And it tends to be, you can please these two, but not this one. It's like, you know, pick two of the three. And I don't have the answer to that, but I would love to think there is a world coming where at a minimum taste and health aren't seen in opposition to one another. Um, yeah, and I, can I, I, I would add to that. I mean, I'm not, it probably doesn't, these words don't spill out of my mouth regularly that, that <laughs> there's some sort of sympathy with companies or that they're kind of in a bind when it comes to what they can do. But, you know, they're not, I mean, how many times have I written this? They're not in the business of public health. They're in the business that's of true. profit. And that's what it is. Um, and, and I'm not saying it is even negative because we all have our money invested in 401ks and we want companies to do well. So you know, to, to put that hat on and think that way, um, you know, it's, it's, there's evidence of this really in a case study of PepsiCo, um, putting money behind their healthier brands and then mm -hmm. having to go back to the core brands when it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it circles back to a broader policy that levels the playing field. And I think allows for, you know, restrictions or reductions in marketing or some sort of parameters that are put around things that are put around for everybody. And then that would give an opportunity for healthier brands or for better competition with healthier products with each other. But until you have that, asking companies to stick their neck out um, and just kind of reduce their profits and have someone else, you know, take those is not really good for the company. Um, and I, I think that really speaks to a, a bigger policy, a big, you know, sort of more government policies that kind of go across everybody. And I think that might help some of these um, companies that want to do to promote healthier brands actually get into the space. Yeah. And there, it's not a trivial point. There's like uh, a really, uh, the, our, my food science colleagues like to bring this one up all the time, the uh, soup. So I, I, I'm not going to say the soup company names because I'll, I'll get them wrong, I'm sure. But um, there are two soup companies and one 
was reducing sodium in all of their soups like across the board and they were like okay we're going to cut sodium and they made a big deal about it they put it on all of their cans and everything and so like from a public health perspective everyone should be like oh yeah that's perfect like they're they're doing what they're supposed to they're cutting sodium out of their product they're they're letting people know about it and so that seems like a win across the board but it tanked like they yeah. they stopped selling soup <laughs> and um but there's another company that did the same thing but they just did it quietly and they just reduced the sodium over time in their soup to the same level and it didn't affect their market share at all and they did the right thing but the thing is the the thing that we talk about all the time is they don't get credit for that, right? Like they don't get credit for having done that because they had to do it quietly to make it acceptable to the consumer, which yeah. seems totally backwards to a lot of us and, and a lot of us in the nutrition space in particular, because we care about that stuff a lot, but I would say the general consumer <laughs> probably doesn't care as much as, as we do. Yeah. Um, and so like, it it's a, it's a really weird conundrum where a lot of times we go, oh yeah, this should be the thing. But I think that's the Francis's point is like, if they, if, if there was some policy or, or agreement or regulation that came in and said like we need to drop sodium to this level within a in a given you know product then it levels the playing field for everybody so they can reformulate at those levels right and, and then it, it brings the competition back um in in check because that the the problem of always having competing products that may or may not have the same restrictions as you is is problematic because it's it's always going to be it's not just do you like this soup or do you like this soup it's which one do you like more and that's what it because it, it's always going to be a rank choice in most people's in most people's heads it's not a, a matter of how much do you like it but which one do you like so i think what's interesting travis about your soup example because it's a great one in terms of like is it stealth or is it like front of pack where we're telling them look what we've done is like just playing that out and kind of being devil's advocate if there was a rule that said all soups have to be at this level of x milligrams per serving whatever i would submit to you what would happen is one of two things soup sales would just tank across the board across the board <laughs> and or people would still buy their favorite soup that they've eaten for years or they remember from childhood or whatever mm -hmm. And they would add salt to it. Yeah. <laughs> they put their own salt in. And it's true. Maybe they would put less salt than the manufacturer otherwise would have put in. But this conversation takes me back to the era of the 100 calorie pack, you know, that we should have more portion control. Portions are huge. Like no one needs a thousand calorie, you know, serving of anything. Um, so then 100 calorie packs came along and quickly we were getting reports from consumers. They're great. They eat three of them, <laughs> yeah. right? And so I think at some point there has to be, and I say that with a laugh and I don't mean to make comedy of something that was meant to be really legit and serious, but I think there's like some point at which, like where does, wh who's responsible for which decisions at which point along the way? And I'm not saying the industry, you know, the industry shouldn't, take ownership and take major responsibility here. I'm not saying that at all. They should. Um, but the consumer will do what the consumer will do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there 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 are ways around a lot of it. Like if you're gonna make all my soup fit a low sodium healthy guideline, I either am not going to buy soup or I'm going to add my own salt. And I just put that out there as just that reminder that like how would we get it to a world where there is shared responsibility and that consumers, if nothing else, feel empowered to make good decisions and feel that the things like accessibility and affordability and all these things, you know, make the default option the, the healthier one and like those kinds yeah. of conversations mm -hmm. so that at least what they find themselves just kind of falling into by virtue of just habit and norms in their household or whatever, isn't like grossly unhealthy. You know what I mean? Like make healthy, you know, easier, I guess is the word I'm trying to say, because the yeah. consumer will do what the consumer will do. And all the, you know, I live more in the world of consumer survey research, less, well, that's not true. We do a lot on, you know, looking at following the academic research and some of the papers you've all even mentioned. But what I, what I was aiming to say is that 
consumers will say a lot when you ask and survey them that doesn't always line up with purchasing behavior yeah. and purchasing behavior doesn't always line up with actual consumption behavior. Mm -hmm. So I say this, I purchase that, I consume this. And like drawing a line through those three things is, it's a curvy wavy line. Yeah, and I still think it's, I mean, that's kind of an empirical question to know if you did do some sort of sodium uh, reduction across all products, what would actually happen? Mm. And so I still would like to see, uh, to, to know if that's the case, because if there are people who are not adding more sodium, well, then that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, you, you won't know that until um, it's it's tried really, um, but, but it does prevent this, um, you know, one company sticking its neck out and it and and it does also have the advantage of working towards um, something that would be you know better better health so i think um policies like that are still worth a, a a try i don't think that they're something that should be um ignored because they're looked at as you know a, a decision that you could say oh it's just never going to work i mean at least we could try but but to say that point you know, the reformulation, I get a little frustrated because the non-nutritive sweeteners that is going into mm -hmm. products, especially for children that say low sugar on the front and, you know, there's no testing that's been done on non-nutritive sweeteners on, on young children um, is super problematic. And so in, the, in this effort to reduce added sugar in children's diets, um, it, replacing it with these other types mm -hmm. of non-nutritive sweeteners is what's happening right now and I don't think it's a good direction yeah. I mean look at Capri Sun monk fruit and uh, thank you I'm just going to jump in because I'm aware of the time here that also makes me think of um the snack whales situation as well when we have these unintended consequences of trying to fix one problem and then a, another problem comes up but we do have two questions from the audience here so I'm going to frame this first one more generally so is there have has uh, have groups traced the impact of advertising on consumer choices overall and even by different demographics? I think there's yeah. lots of research on that, yeah. but Travis, you can jump in first. Well, <laughs> I was gonna say I I actually I, I don't I don't know if there's been a ton done. The 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 thing that comes to mind for me is that we do know that certain ads are targeted at certain demographics uh like um so we know for example certain racial groups get targeted more heavily by certain types of advertising um so the impacts of that are i don't know um like up in the air i guess but um we like we we saw that well, we didn't see it. This is a hard thing. We didn't want to like highlight this big in our paper, but the we we did an analysis of a big um, ad campaign online and and how influence uh, how influencers were engaging with their audiences, and um, we we just noted <laughs> that the influencers that were selected were from some of these targeted demographics. Mm -hmm. And so again, like we didn't want to say like. That, that was purposeful or, or anything like that but i think those questions come up of like i think especially in the digital space i think it's an unanswered question of like yeah what influencers and how are they being used uh, i think is is wide open so mm -hmm. yeah and then I'll, i'm going to jump um thank you to the last question we have here so deanne was mentioning that this hashtag disclosure um is really interesting but are there um, limitations to that when it comes to children or even young adolescents in terms of understanding what that means and understanding what marketing is? Yes, I think um, Travis was alluding to some of the research that was done that um, when uh, in, it is a, a well-designed study and in, in the condition where people were told that what they were seeing was an ad, they actually liked the product more um, and like the influencer more and felt that the influencer, you know, potentially felt the influencer was honest about it. I can't remember the exact measures that they used, but it certainly didn't um, reduce the impact of the brand presence and make people think, um, oh, I'm not going to like this product because this, you know, influencer is telling me, is selling it to me. And you know, that's not really what, what happens. Um, so it, you might increase awareness of that it's an ad, but it doesn't make you like the product or the the influencer less 
this is I wonder this, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I wonder though if there are certain situations where it would change though, right? So uh so again, I guess I guess one of my hosts at this round table is that people you all get excited about wanting to <laughs> look into some of this stuff more deeply. But I think that's a great question is like, is there a product match or mismatch that you could make? that could get people to dislike the influencer or dislike the product um, in some way, right? Yeah. Well, then why would the product want to be there? If that I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a question, right? But I think it would be interesting because it would give you like uh, some indication of, of how that works, right? Sounds a little devious though. It would be funded by the product's competitor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I think. laughs> I didn't say that, but you know. This is a Coke Pepsi <laughs> thing, right? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to, I, again, this has been really, really enjoyable. Um, it, we're at that minute where we have to log off. Um, Travis, I like how you mentioned these ideas for other, uh, for young researchers and students to investigate. I think that's fantastic. Um, any final quick closing thoughts, Fran? Well, I say my, my thing I say all the time is if it's marketed to kids, it's probably not good for you. Um, <laughs> And that's, that's an unfortunate but um, true uh, statement in my world. Uh, but I do think that people should get excited to do more research. And to that point, it would be nice to see if um, we could think about how to promote healthier products. And I think that there, you know, I can be, I don't want to be so negative because I would like the space to be healthier for sure. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Do you have any closing remarks? Sure. I would just say that I I hope the conversation for those who are listening um, you know sparks some really interesting thinking on what could be possible in the future both research translational research and in the actual marketplace um, I think if something is this powerful you know the thing being social media influencers if something is this powerful to have some real negative consequences it is as powerful to have some really positive consequences, you know, positive impacts. And so I really hope that, especially for the students that were listening to this, that your brains are turning on what could be possible. Cause I just want to believe, like maybe I'm too optimistic here, but I want to believe there's a path forward that some of these tools that right now are really concerning us and we see running off the course of what we would want could get back on the road and be actually extremely powerful and impactful in a good way. Well said. That's great. And then Travis, you want to take the last word? <laughs> sure. Well, I guess I just reiterate what what they've said it, it is that like I think sometimes when we talk about these things, it can come across very negative, but it's just because we understand how strong it is and and how important it is to address. So, um it's but on the flip side, kind of what Rachel's saying is like, we need to make sure that we can utilize the systems that are in place in our favor, right? So like reformulation, even just thinking supply chains, like those types of things are, they're big assets that have come from um, like our food environment, but they're just not being optimized for health, right? And so there has to be, and hopefully <laughs> there's interest in, you know, optimizing these and and that should point out like all the future that there is in this space of like understanding all these gray and difficult kind of concepts and and how can we put a policy and how can we regulate how could we test this out how could we um, encourage companies to you know become healthier overall right and so um, so yeah. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, thank you everyone on the panel. Thank you everyone for being here. Kelly, thank you for hosting. Um, do you have, Kelly, do you need to do anything? I here? think we're good. We can, we can let everyone transition to the awesome. next um, presentation yeah. and thank you all for being yeah. here.